All right, all right. So good morning to the last class of this semester. Uh, we are very sad, of course, that we reach an end, right? We would have been wanting to provide more and more content to you. I mean, at least I like to talk and, you know, um, explain things. Um, so today the plan is the following. Uh, we're going to have Jan talking about um, random stuff. That's what he said. <laughs> Uh, then he's going to be talking about the future of uh, AI deep learning. I mean, what he thinks uh, it's the, the road in front of us. Uh, then we're going to have the question and answer section. I'm going to be reading the most upvoted questions you wrote on, uh, um, on, on Campus Wire. So if you haven't yet upvoted uh, questions, or just have a look to the whatever questions that come out, you know, overnight or whatever, such that you, if you see something that is interesting, uh, you may want to, you know, vote it. So it thumbs up. So you actually can hear the answer to that question. And this is going to be for the first three quarters of the class. And then in the last half an hour ish, more or less, we're going to be uh, going over the uh, video presentations of the top five uh, entries in the leaderboard uh, so we can then announce the winner of this semester competition and so yeah i want to i don't want to say spoilers right so I, I don't want to add more about the competition right now and i have no idea <laughs> where jan is at the moment he seems to be online he should have the link we are on the right class i believe because i see 50 people here already hello Maybe someone has internet connection issues. Um, otherwise, what do I talk about, right? So how can I entertain you? Let me think. So while we are waiting, I, I will just entertain you with uh, some, some additional knowledge, right? At least this time I, I thought it uh, in advance what I should be doing. It's not going to be showing the screen such that we actually can do we are not going to waste our time, right? Share the screen. Okay. So there is another notebook uh, interesting uh, that we didn't cover. Uh, it's going to be PDL, um, Conda, Activate, PDL, uh, Jupyter Notebook, and there we go. Yeah, I'm, I'm just improvising, right? This is not, it was not planned. It's okay. So on the, on the, on the notebook, right, you have this additional, um, folder, which is called extra. And then inside here, you have other three, uh, uh notebooks. Uh, okay. Jan actually appears. So actually we can actually start with the lesson, but, uh, otherwise I would also recommend you to have a look about this projection, which is showing you that everything in a high dimensional space is basically orthogonal to each other. And then there is this custom grads module, uh, notebook, which is telling you how to create custom, uh, modules, which have uh, functions may be written in a Python, in a NumPy, but then you also have to specify two functions, the forward pass and then the backward pass. Right? Okay. Since Jan is here, then we are not going to have this additional section. So let me stop my screen sharing. Maybe, you know, we can talk about this next time. Hi, hi Jan. Morning. Good morning, everyone. I already introduced today lesson. So we're going to be starting with the random stuff as you pointed out. Then we're going to move on to the future of AI. And then we're going to have the question answer uh, session. And finally, the, um, the, the project top five uh, entries. So okay. I will, so I will so let's, let, let's start with, uh, you know, tying up some odds and ends, uh, you know, a couple topics, I short topics, I, 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 I meant to talk about uh, and didn't get a chance until now. Okay. Uh, There's basically only one topic, actually. The rest will be mostly uh, answering questions. Um, so let's start with um, uh, something I, I meant to talk about, and this is going to be a combination of uh, a couple slides plus um, a little bit of algebra on the screen. Um, okay, so here's a reformulation of deep learning as uh, constraint optimization. And the reason I'm seeing this, I'm, I'm talking about this, is because it opens the door to sort of uh, other ways to do uh, deep learning or backprop, sort of generally speaking, that we have alluded to in the past without really kind of delving into the into the theory. Uh, 
Okay, so when we're doing, uh, when we're building a deep learning system, let's say it's just a layered system, right? So it's just a sequence of modules. We don't have any complex graph, but we can easily extend uh, the formalism to uh, a general connection graph. Um, it's just that the notation becomes a little more hairy. So I didn't want to kind of uh, uh, make it too heavy. Uh, so we have uh, a loss function, which depends on the training sample X and Y. This is for a single sample. And it depends, of course, on the parameters of our system. And we want to minimize some cost function that basically measures, uh, you know, the discrepancy between, for example, the last layer and the desired output Y, right? This is for supervised learning or a generative model of some kind. Um, but we have to satisfy a bunch of constraints. So the constraints are that uh, the internal state of uh, the the uh, of of the system, the activation tensor, if you want, at layer k, or at layer k plus one rather, um, should be equal to uh, a function g k applied to z k w k, right? So you have the module number k, and the module number k takes as input the the input z k with the parameter w k, and it produces the output z k plus one. And what we're saying here is that the output of module k should be equal to the input of module k plus one, right? But we view this as a constraint, essentially. And then there's an additional constraint, uh, which is just a notation. Uh, we just denote um, uh, uh, x as, as z0, okay? So we just make sure x z0 is equal to x. A small note here, z is not yep. the latent variable. z is actually our internal representation. So we should actually be writing h for hidden. So just a small note, right? except that in the next line, it will become a latent variable, ah. which is why it is okay. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So the next line is uh, is here. So here uh, I made the, the, the loss function more explicitly dependent upon not just X and Y, but also dependent upon the, those two extra variables, Z and Lambda, okay? Um, and basically I've, I've written this in the form of uh, Lagrangian. So Lagrangian, um, if I'm sure pretty much all of you have seen uh, how you can express an optimization of the constraint uh, with a Lagrangian. Um, and I know it's intuitively mysterious why this works, okay? Uh, and I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to attempt to, um, to explain this uh, more, more graphically, but just, um, you know, take it as a, as a given for now. Um, the way you express uh, a minimization of the constraint problem is that you build a function which is the sum of the original function you want to minimize plus uh, the a sum of the set of constraints that you have multiplied by uh, uh, what's called a Lagrange multiplier, okay, which is usually denoted lambda. And here, our constraints are ve vector constraints. So our Lagrange multiplier itself is a vector. So this is the dot product between the Lagrange multiplier vector, which would be the same dimension as z, as zk plus one in this uh, in this case. In fact, I should probably call this uh, lambda k plus one, technically. Uh, in fact, I really should have called it say, uh, lambda k plus one, that's, for, that's a typo. Um, uh, and, and this just expresses the fact that zk plus one needs to be equal to uh, jk of zk wk, okay? Um, Right, so now the optimality conditions uh, for Lagrangian optimization is that we want to set the, we want to find a set of values for Z and Lambda and W also, such that uh, the, the gradient, uh, the derivatives essentially, but the gradients or the, 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 of, of, uh, of this function with respect to uh, Z, Lambda and W is zero. Okay, so we have three conditions. First one is uh, um, derivative with respect to ZK must be equal to zero. And, and again, this is ZK being, being a vector. This is a row vector. Uh, second one is with respect to lambda K and last one with respect to WK. Um, okay, so this kind of optimization is actually a saddle point optimization. What we're looking for is a, a minimum with respect to Z and with respect to W, but it's a maximum with respect to lambda. And this is where the intuition of Lagrangian optimization uh, comes in. You, you, I mean, you don't have, you don't need to have the intuition. Uh, you can just do the math blindly. Uh, but it's, it's kind of cool to be able to understand what what's what's going on. So, um, it's sort of a, a very quick um, reminder of really what uh, uh, what Lagrangian optimization is. So, let's say you have a 
a function, I'm just going to make it depend on a single variable z. Okay, um, and you have a set of constraints, uh, which is you know z must be, you know, inside of uh, some 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 curve, but must be you know was belong to a curve of some kind. Okay, so essentially in the space of z's, let's say this is z one z two. Uh, I have a cost function, which, you know, let's say it's a quadratic cost function, uh, which is kind of something like this, where these are the lines of equal cost. Okay. And the curve, the constraint is something like that. Okay. So where is the value of Z that uh, minimizes the cost, but yet is on the curve. Okay, and that value is right here. Okay, this is the point where, so what's characteristic about this point? Uh, this, at this point, the gradient of the, of the cost is pointing this way, right? Because it, it's orthogonal to the you know, the, the, the line of equal cost, right? Hopefully I've drawn this properly. Okay, it's not exactly orthogonal here, but just imagine this is orthogonal to the, um, to the line of equal cost, okay? But um, what I can, uh, the way I can express the, the curve is the curve is, you know, some function uh, g of z equals zero, right? That's the, that's the equation of the curve. Okay, so my Lagrangian would be would be something like uh, L of z and lambda is equal to C of z, the cost function I want to minimize, plus lambda, which is a vector, uh, times g of z because my constraint is that g of z equals zero. Okay. Um, so g of z itself has a gradient. Um, in fact, I'm going to make it green so that. Okay. Uh, in fact, no, I should make it red because I did it. I made it red uh, initially. Sorry about that. Okay. And what is the gradient of GOZ? So GOZ is a function that obviously, you know, to the bottom left of the red curve is let's say uh, negative and to the top right of the red curve is positive, right? Because it crosses zero on the red curve, right? The red curve is G of Z equals zero, okay? So on this side, G of Z is positive on that side is negative, let's say. Um, so I can compute the gradient of G of Z, okay? And the gradient of G of Z is gonna be an arrow and at the optimal point, G of Z is actually has the same direction uh, the gradient of G of Z, okay? So this is, uh, G of Z with respect to Z, right? And the blue stuff is D uh, of C with respect to Z. Okay, so at the optimal point, um, basically those two are aligned, okay? And we can we can we can look at another point, right? So if I take another point, let's say this one here. Here the the, the gradient of the cost uh, goes this way. Whereas the gradient of G goes that way. Okay, it's orthogonal to the curve G, right? If I take another point here, the gradient of the cost here. Is kind of like this way, and the gradient of G is that way. Okay, so it's just you know those two arrows are not aligned, and when when you reach the minimum, uh, you are on the curve, but you are at the minimum of the of the function. Those two gradients are aligned. Okay, and so basically, what you what you can say is that. You know, there there exists some some value lambda, okay, for which uh, gradient of C of Z 
at, at the minimum. So let's call it Z star. Uh, is going to be proportional to uh, the gradient of G of Z. Okay, and the proportionality constraint, constra uh, proportionally constant, we call it lambda. Um, so then the problem becomes, um, you know, how do we find uh, how do we find this lambda, and how do we find the point where those two those two gradients are uh, are aligned? Um, and so here's a trick, right? Um, if I, I mean, it's not a trick, but <laughs> If I look at the, the, the function, if, if I cut, I make a cut, you know, near the, the, the solution point, I mean, at, at the solution point, and I look at the, the values of the two functions, at the, you know, the, the two curves. So C uh, here is, is going to, you know, in, in this sort of purple, uh, in this purple frame of reference, uh, the, the, the C function, you know, is going to look like, like this, right? It's going to be a parabola of some kind. It doesn't go to zero because we, not necessarily at least. Uh, and then the, the constraint is, is here. Um, and what is the, 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 the slope? So the, I'm going to plot G. Okay. And G kind of, you know, I can make it simple. I can I can say that G is linear, for example. No, G is equal to zero, no, at that point. Uh, you're right. I'm sorry. Um, so. We have uh, we have a, a gradient, um, you know, a slope here for this function, and of course we have a slope for for g, and those two slopes, um, uh, you know, we have to find a lambda basically that makes uh, that when we multiply the the second slope by this lambda, those two things are equal. So why does that matter? It matters because uh, we we basically want to make the effect of the constraint. Okay, here's the thing: if we don't, if we have a small lambda, the system will want to find a point that really minimizes uh, c. So this is c. And this is g. So if lambda is small, okay, the gradient of of g in the in the loss function doesn't matter very much. Okay, so the system will find a minimum of this compound function for a small lambda that is, you know, close to its to the minimum it wants. Um, not taking the the gradient of g very much into account. Okay, and as you increase the lambda, the importance of the second term kind of raises. Okay, and and so as you increase lambda, the the solution, the the minimum of this function with respect to z. Uh, is going to get closer and closer to that until when g of z equals zero, this term doesn't matter anymore. Okay, so you increase lambda, you you crank it up until uh, the second term disappears because g of z becomes zero, right? And that's when you satisfy the constraint, uh, but at the same time, you know, you you find a point where those two gradients are uh, are aligned, and so that's the kind of intuition behind Lagrangian uh, minimization of the constraint. Okay, uh, and I tell you, a lot of people don't have like it's it's a difficult intuition to have, but it's kind of useful. Um, a lot of people are asking themselves like, why can't I just make lambda infinite? But the point is, you don't need to. <laughs> um, uh, so here's here's another uh, formulation of uh, minimization of the constraint, which is uh, which is through a penalty function. So I can write another Lagrangian. Uh, sorry, z and lambda. 
and it would be C of Z plus, I'm not going to call it lambda, I'm going to call it alpha, and it's just a scalar now. C of Z squared, okay? So now this is a penalty function. I'm making the system pay for making G of Z non-zero, okay? And I, I just choose alpha, which kind of will pick the, the trade-off between minimizing C and minimizing uh, uh, the, the square norm of G of G of Z. So this will not find uh, an exact solution where the, you know, when the, uh, uh, the, the constraint is satisfied, okay? It will find a trade-off. And there, if you want to exactly satisfy the constraint, you basically have to crank up alpha to infinity, right? And so that's an easy intuition to have. If you have a penalty function and you want the penalty function to be zero, you crank up the coefficient in front of it to infinity, which of course may cause all kinds of numerical problems, but, um, but that will give you, that will approach the, the, the solution that you know, both satisfies the, the constraint G of Z equals zero, but also minimizes the cost function C, okay? But the beauty of Lagrangian optimization is that uh, you don't put the square, it's not a penalty. Um, and the lambda only needs to be just large enough so that the gradient of, of G um, is, is equal in length and, and collinear, but opposite to, the, um, to the, the gradient of the cost, okay? And as soon as lambda has this critical value, um, you satisfy the constraint, okay? Um, now, what's interesting about this is that the process we've been doing here, cranking up lambda, is a maximization of this uh, L function with respect to lambda, okay? So the optimal point uh, for our optimization problem is a minimum of L of Z lambda with respect to Z, but a maximum with respect to lambda, right? So that's what, that's what we, we're, we're gonna do here. We are, we're gonna compute the, the gradients of, of, of this function with respect to Z, lambda, and, and W. These are the, the variables we're interested in computing. Uh, and we'll see, we'll see how it goes. We're gonna start with this one because it's easy, okay? So we're gonna compute the gradient of this with respect to lambda. And the gradient of this with respect to lambda K is just this, ZK plus one minus GK, blah, blah, blah. And we're gonna set this to zero. And what is that gonna give us? This is gonna give us forward prop, okay? So if I compute the, the gradient of the Lagrangian with respect to, to lambda, I get ZK plus one minus um, GK of ZKWK, I set that to zero. And what I get is ZK plus one equals um, GK ZKWK. It's not surprising really, right? That's the constraint we wanted. So basically satisfying the constraint tells us you have to run forward prop, okay? Nothing new there. I mean, why did we need Lagrangian optimization for that? But that, the second one is where it becomes interesting. So, so now we're gonna talk about the first, um, uh, the first condition here. So we're gonna have to differentiate this with respect to ZK. Uh, there is a special case where Z, ZK is equal to Z big K, right? The last layer. And there we're gonna get the gradient with respect to the, the gradient of the cost with respect to, uh, to ZK. But I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to ignore this for a minute. Um, so here we're gonna have two terms. One term is gonna be lambda K plus one because uh, uh, if I, my notation prop, uh, proper, when I, when I differentiate with respect to ZK here, I get this lambda K, right? Multiplied by the, Jacobian of, of this G with respect to ZK, okay? But there's also the case where, uh, you know, this is K, right? And therefore this is K minus one, okay? So what I will get is uh, when I differentiate with respect to this, I'll get lambda K minus one and then minus uh, lambda K uh, uh, times the, the Jacobian matrix basically of G with respect to, uh, to ZK. And that's, um, that's what you see here. Um, let's see, I actually screwed up the indices here. Uh, sorry, this is wrong. Uh, <laughs> this should be a minus one and this should be uh, ZK. And I'm not sure why I got this wrong here. Um, I'm, I'm gonna redo this. 
But basically, if this were correct, so you would get lambda k minus one, uh, gradient of g k minus one with respect to all those things times lambda k. Okay. And that's backprop. And I'm not sure why I flipped my indices here. Um, in fact, I can probably. Uh, this right. So this is minus one, minus one. Okay, um, and this is this is the backprop equation where lambda is 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 the gradient vector, right? You take the gradient vector at layer k, you multiply it by the Jacobian matrix, essentially transposed in this case, of the the function that computes lambda k for, and that computes zk from zk minus one. And that gives you the gradient with respect to uh, zk minus one. That's just backprop, okay? So it's a, bit of a, it's a bit of magic here, which is that you don't have to think about like about anything. You can just do blind, uh, not too blind like me, but like blind um, algebra essentially, uh, calculus, and, and you'll, you know, you'll get the backprop equation naturally. Um, and then for the, the last equation, which is uh, the last condition, uh, uh, which is with respect to the weights, you don't get anything useful. You get a way to compute the gradient of the, of the loss with respect to the weights, but it doesn't give you a condition that you can easily satisfy by just computing something. And so that you're going to have to optimize with gradient descent. But now you know how to compute the gradient. That's basically the gradient of the loss with respect to W. And this is really similar to what you know, we've been uh, we've been talking about. You take the state at at uh, layer k plus one, um, z k plus one, uh, and you know you multiply it by the. Uh, in fact, this is backwards um, by the 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 transpose of the the gradient at, at that layer, and that essentially gives you the the uh, the gradient with respect to the weights. Um, yeah, the dimensions here are a little funny, but if if you instantiate gk, for example, as being you know w w k z k, right? So a linear layer, you'll find the usual, and you apply and you substitute in this, you'll find the usual equation for for backprop and how you compute the gradient. Uh, same if you if gk is a nonlinear function and there is no w k. Um, okay, so um, why am I telling you all this? Uh, so first of all, you've seen, you've heard uh, uh, Alfredo will talk about optimal control, model, predi model predictive control, the Kelly Bryson algorithm, and things like that. That you've heard me sort of mention it uh, and planning. The people who invented this for the purpose of uh, of planning uh, were optimal control theorists in the in the fifties and sixties. So in the West, it's known it's, it's known as so this this principle here. Um, that you set all those things to zero here. That's called the Pontryagin principle, actually, extra, uh, Pontryagin extremum principle. So Pontryagin was uh, uh, Pontryagin was a Russian uh, mathematician working on optimal control, basically, and sort of came up with the sort of mathematics that goes around this, okay? There's, there's, there's a lot more to the Pontryagin uh, extremum principle than, than this, but, but that's, the, um, that's the basic thing. But originally this came from classical mechanics, Lagrangian mechanics. So in fact, this was uh, pretty much invented by Lagrange and uh, Euler and a few others. Um, so when, you're, when you want to, for example, compute the, the, the time trajectory of, let's say a rolling ball running down a, a track, uh, you you have to say like you know the the trajectory is constrained to a particular curve, uh, but then the energy you know kinetic and and uh, potential energies are conserved, and you write a Lagrangian which is uh, you know the uh, overall uh, uh, energy. In fact, the Lagrangian is the difference between the uh, kinetic and potential energy, um, and and that. You know, can include the constraints of the trajectory, and then you do this mathematical focus, focus and you you can compute the trajectory directly. 
Uh, okay, so one reason to think about this is because of this idea of replacing a constraint by a penalty. Um, so if I write, if I rewrite this, uh, Lagrangian, Um, and I do the same transformation I did before, which is that I turn, uh, I turn the, I'm going to turn this cost function into a constraint, and I'm going to turn this constraint into a cost function. Um, if you do it in a particular way, that's called a Lagrange dual. Okay, so uh, I'm going to have a lambda prime transpose here, um, C of, and I have only one. Uh, and those are going to be uh, alpha k, which you know can be a. In fact, I don't even need this. Zk plus one minus gk. Zk wk squared. Right. So I basically turn my constraint into a penalty and turn my uh, cost function into a constraint. Okay, so now I have a new constraint optimization problem. And if you think about this, um, it's like I have a, a neural net. It says it's got three layers uh, with the cost function. Okay, but then I have a penalty for making a particular Z. Okay, let's call it ZK. And this guy is ZK plus one. I have a cost. So this is G. This is G. So this is G, um, GK. It's GK plus one. Ek minus one. So this cost is a square distance between the two things that I enter it, and it's uh, you know basically one of those terms in this sum. And I have another one here, of course. Okay, but this this one now becomes becomes a constraint. An equality constraint. I could keep it as a cost. Okay, so how do I use something like this? Like, you know, what's what's the form of backdrop that works here? I plug an X and a Y, and then I have to, uh, you know, minimize this new this new Lagrangian with respect to uh, with respect to zk. Okay, I also have to maximize with respect to lambda, but I don't care about this. I can just make. Um, I can just make sure that whatever comes out uh, at the output is equal to y, okay? That's basically the constraint. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to find uh, all the zk's that um, uh, essentially guarantee that the output is equal to the, the one I want, uh, but that all of those uh, additional terms here are minimized, which means I want every zk to be as close as possible to the whatever output comes out of the previous module, okay? And I can do this, I can do all of this by gradient descent, right? So by gradient descent, if I maintain this constraint, I can find what value should I give to zk plus one so that uh, this, con this constraint is satisfied. I can do this by gradient descent. Uh, that assumes that G actually has the right property. You know, it, it may be impossible for me to find a zk that actually satisfies the constraint. In that case, I'll just minimize uh, CK, I mean C. Uh, but I'm gonna find ZK plus one that minimizes, uh, that you know 
makes the output equal to y. And once I have that, uh, I can find the value of zk that makes this guy and this guy as close to possible as close to zero as possible, right? Um, so I can sort of jointly minimize with respect to all the zk's that are free variables, latent variables now, so that my uh, Lagrangian is minimized. And this is target prop. So basically, once I've done this optimization with respect to the zk's, what I have for the zk's are targets for the previous layer. So now my, my learning procedure is super simple because uh, to figure out the weights of that G, the WK, I just need to minimize that cost because you know, I know the target value that it should take for this particular sample. Um, so I can just, you know, if G is, for example, a, a linear layer, I can actually compute analytically by solving a system what the value of the, of the weight is that would satisfy the constraint. All right, to your good in descent. Now, uh, I can't really do this. I mean, I, I would need to do this over a fairly large batch if I wanted to do this, right? So I would take a batch. Uh, for each sample in the batch, I would compute the optimal ZK, okay, which is the entire state of the internal neural net uh, that kind of optimizes uh, this, uh, this Lagrangian. Uh, and then once I have all those ZKs, I can locally apply a, a, a learning procedure to every layer that uh, essentially modifies or just sets the, the parameters of the, of the layer to whatever value kind of minimizes the, the little quadratic cost that comes out of it. And if the layer is a linear layer, it's, it's linear regression, right? Super easy to solve. Uh, so that's target prop. We've um, we've seen an example of this in uh, the the Lista method, right? So in Lista, you have uh, you have a Y, okay, and it's you 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 train an autoencoder. So there is a decoder, and there's a, a latent variable Z. And the latent variable may, may have another cost, some sort of regularizer, like a sparsity or something, right? Uh, and what, you, what you're doing simultaneously is that you're training an encoder to predict the optimal value of Z, but you compute the optimal value of Z by doing gradient descent. But there's an additional term in the cost, which is how different Z is from the output of the encoder. So you have, th you have three costs here. You have the reconstruction error, C, you have um, the regularizer on Z, and you have the distance to the prediction by the encoder. Um, so there, C is not viewed as a constraint, it's just another cost. You find a Z that minimizes the sum of those three terms, and once you have that, Z now acts as a target value for the encoder, and you can train the encoder to do a better job at predicting next time. And if the encoder does a good job, then once the system is properly trained, uh, when you plug a Y, you can just run through the encoder and get a pretty good prediction for what the optimal Z is. And so, um, as, you, as you remember, uh, people now call this uh, amortized inference. And this is the idea of essentially training a neural net to predict the optimal value of an optimization problem so that you don't have to run the optimization algorithm every time. Um, okay, I think, I think I'm gonna now switch to talking about the, the, the future of AI, and I'm, I'm still gonna use the, the board actually. Um, so, uh, Okay, there's this several, qu several questions concerning the, the future of AI. Uh, and this is my personal idea about where I think things are going, okay? You may or may not believe it. <laughs> um, I imagine a lot of people may disagree with what I'm gonna say. But um, I'm gonna tell you what I think is, you know, where I, where I think things are going and what, what is important and what to watch for for the next few years, or what to work on if you, if you wanna do a PhD or if you wanna get into, into research. 
Um, so clearly, as I said, uh, when we talked about uh, self-supervised learning, the future is really in self-supervised learning. Uh, so increasingly, I think uh, most of our, you know, our, our, our neural nets are going to get bigger and bigger, and they're going to be trained with some form of self-supervised learning before being fine-tuned for tasks that we are interested in. Okay, so that's the future. The other future is uh, sort of uh, unified architectures. or unified models. Uh, you see this trend already in industry, and you've seen this in some of the guest lectures, that you know, in the past, you would train a separate model for uh, you know, recognizing a particular type of object, localizing objects in images. Uh, you would train a separate model to do translation from one language to another. You would um, have separate models for speech recognition for each uh, different language. And now the trend is that you basically get one giant big vision system that does everything. Okay, it's trained on multiple tasks, but usually it's actually pre-trained in self-supervised learning or with weak labels, and then fine-tuned for all the tasks that you want it to be uh, good at. Okay, but it's, it ends up being a bigger network, but it ends up doing a lot of things simultaneously. Uh, NLP systems, uh, let's say translation systems now are multilingual, right? So they, they're trained with multiple languages, simultaneously, and they basically build an internal representation of text that is independent of language so that you can use them in sort of, uh, you know, for a lot of different tasks. Uh, and similarly for speech recognition system, you basically have a single speech recognition system that is trained for all languages. So why is it a good idea? It's because all of those tasks have a lot in common. And so you want to sort of share resources between all those tasks so that you can, you can train bigger networks with bigger data sets um, and and exploit the redundancy between those various things, right? So uh, you want to you know translate uh, one language into you know different sort of sub languages of kind of you know a root language that that is uh, uh, you know such that the sub languages are very similar to each other. Um, you know you really want to exploit the redundancy between them. Um, you know same for for speech and, and images, you know, recognizing images is just, I mean, images are images, right? Uh, at least natural images are natural images. There are images that are unnatural, okay? Connect, connected from various types of sensors and everything. But even then we, we can see uh, good transfers, right? So people have done things like, you know, pre-train uh, a, a conventional net on ImageNet and then fine tune it for X-ray, uh, you know, detection of, tumors and stuff like that in x-rays. And this actually improves the performance to do the pre-training on ImageNet, strangely enough, because um, images are images. So that's the, the trend towards unified architecture. What that means is that, so the, co the, the combination of those two trends is going to cause neural nets to become bigger and bigger, uh, but to do more and more things for us, OK? Um, I think the future of SSL, uh, and you've heard a lot about this, uh, is uh, non-contrastive methods. Because contrastive methods don't scale. So things like, uh, you know, I've talked about the, you know, BYOL, Barlow twins. There, there's a whole bunch of them that are, are appearing every, not every day, but almost every week nowadays. Um, there's a new one actually coming from uh, my uh, group at, at Facebook uh, called VicReg. So this is uppercase V-I-C. Um, and it's it's not out yet on archive, but it will come, up, come out probably over the next week or so. Uh, it's sort of a, a variation of uh, Barlow Twins. Uh, so I'm, a, I'm very hopeful that this kind of methods actually are going to be developed not just for learning visual features, but for learning features for all kinds of uh, um, applications. And I think the, the big question is, uh, uh, when, when are we gonna be able to use some versions of those to train uh, a system to learn about the world from video, okay? So as I said in, uh, in, the, in the lectures, there's two applications of SSL really, right? The first one is learning, uh, learning representations. And the second one is learning forward models. 
About SSL, there's a question here for yes. Mercedes. So in this competition, we found that SSL took a large amount of compute. An example yeah. is that for many papers like Moco, they stack 128 GPUs. Most of us took a very long time to train. Does this uh, kind of force, uh, does this kind of force this research to be tied to very heavy, um, to have very few specific companies who can make the huge GPU clusters? So I think the application, the large scale applications of it, uh, probably yes. Okay, so there are two things. First of all, hardware is evolving really fast. Hardware for training neural nets is evolving really quickly. Um, you know, we use GPUs, they're getting cheaper and cheaper and more powerful. Uh, right now, they're not that cheap because basically NVIDIA is a monopoly, <laughs> okay? But there's more and more vendors that are kind of coming up on the market that are, you know, are gonna get cheaper. So uh, this kind of competition is gonna get a lot cheaper over the next few years. So that's the good news. Um, the bad news is that, you know, regardless of how cheap it is, you're still gonna, you know, the best systems that are deployed for large scale applications are still going to use like, you know, tons of them. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the high end large scale applications are gonna be in the hands of uh, organizations that have the resources. Now, this is not necessarily just companies. So in some European countries, for example, they have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, like policies where, you know, they, they set up large uh, uh, data centers for, for research, uh, for, for academic research. The and and those you know systems are you know similar similar size as what you get at at, at Facebook or Google or, or whatever. Uh, you you know more or less can use it for free. Um, there are some limits and on the resources obviously, but so I think uh, it's really in the hands of governments to really provide the means for researchers to kind of do this kind of uh, this kind of exploration. Um, it's not a new a new. Um, like a new problem. There's been similar problems, for example, in climate simulation or, or weather prediction or, or fluid dynamics. You know, back back in the old days, you had to use supercomputers. You didn't have it. Didn't have a much of a choice. And the U.S., you know, had, you know, has a bunch of supercomputers that you can request to use for that. They're not designed to do neural nets yet, but they're getting there. Um, and you know, various countries like France and others have uh, these kind of capacities. Um, so, so that, that's kind of the relative good news. The, the other thing is, even if there is still a gap, uh, in performance, uh, with what you have access to, uh, yourself, uh, you can still come up with good ideas, right? In other words, uh, industry doesn't have a monopoly on good ideas. A lot of good ideas come out of, uh, academia. And if you have a good idea, it may not beat a record on, uh, you know, some some you know big name benchmark, um, or, but um, but it will show the way. Let me give you two examples. Um, you know, some of the most interesting ideas over the last uh, decade or so. I mean, half decade maybe, uh, were things like GAN. So GAN was you know came out of University of Montreal. Um, then it was picked up by industry, okay, but only then. Uh, the whole idea of using uh, attention mechanism, multiplicative interactions for things like translation, that was Kung Yung Cho when he was a postdoc in Montreal. Uh, that was quickly picked up by industry and scaled up to a huge degree. Um, so, you know, the, those are a few conceptual ideas. So it's not like University of Montreal and, and Kung Yung Cho beat a record on translation that was done later actually by a group at Stanford. And then that was picked up by industry. And now, you know, academia can't match it, basically. Uh, however, industry makes those trained models available. So that um, uh, that's interesting. There's actually a, a coordinated effort in, in France, for example, uh, to kind of build very large language models for like multilingual, very large language models that would be, you know, public. Uh, it's actually initiated by Hugging Face, I think, but it's, it's kind of a public effort. Um, so, so you know, I think uh, I think there's 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 going to be a bright, a pretty bright future for this.
Okay. Um, I hope I answered all the questions and didn't forget anything. Uh, let's see. Did yeah, so, say again? Did your prediction you were talking about? Yes. So, uh, when, okay, so we can learn, we can use SSL to learn representations. And so far in vision, it's been, and as well as in uh, NLP, it's been done by augmenting uh, the input, you know, artificially by, uh, you know, substituting words in the case of NLP or um, transforming uh, the image in the, in the case of uh, image recognition. Um, for, uh, and, and then using kind of, you know, joint embedding uh, techniques uh, in the case of images or, or denoising autoencoders in the case of uh, NLP. Um, but I think the, 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 the sort of non-contrastive uh, joint, joint embedding is something I would, I would bet on, right? So right now with things like Big Craig, Barlow Twins, BYOL, et cetera, uh, you know, Suave, you have, um, you have two branches. Uh, and, you know, some objective function between them that attempts to kind of maintain the uh, amount of information coming out of the two networks, but while at the same time making the output of the two networks identical when X and Y are related, okay, or, or nearby. But there's going to be, you know, there's extensions of this, right? So in BYOL and similar models, uh, in fact, the architecture is a little bit different from this. So, so here you have the same weight, right? But you, you've seen architectures where the weights are, are shared, but one of the two networks has an extra so-called predictor on top. Um, and you could imagine that this predictor would take as an input the parameters of the transformation from X to Y. Okay, if, if you produce Y by transforming X, you, you might um, actually give the, 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 the parameters of this, uh, of this transformation um, here. Um, so there's been a few attempts at this, but they've not been so far kind of really uh, published or successful or whatever. Um, almost none of them have uh, latent inputs here. Although there are a few papers that are mostly kind of focused on neuroscience that sort of attempt to do this. Um, okay, but that's pretty much what you need. What ultimately what you want is a system where you find, you, you, you show it a video clip you feed it in uh, an encoder and then feed it into some sort of predictor, I don't know, or transform transformation uh, module. I don't know how you call it. Uh, and then simultaneously, you show another piece of video. Uh, and those two encoders might be different because this one might take into account uh, you know, maybe three or four frames or some more, some more, num you know, larger number of frames. And the number of frames here may be different. Maybe it's only one, maybe it's two. Uh, and then what you want is uh, some way of telling with a cost function here, some way for the system to tell those two frames are a good continuation for those four, four frames. Okay, so this would be kind of a prediction combined with uh, joint embedding, but then you can't rely on sharing weights between the, you know, the encoder for X and the uh, encoder for Y, because they have, they may have different inputs. It could be that what you're doing is not uh, predicting video, but you are predicting audio from video or you're predicting text from, uh, from, from images or something like that, right? Uh, it could be cross-model prediction. Uh, so, if we find a good way of training systems like this in ways that prevent them from collapsing, like Barlow Twins, for example, uh, or, or VicRag, which, you know, you might see in a week or so, uh, I think that would be the ticket. Uh, so, something that does not rely on the fact that the two encoders have to have shared weights, that that would be the ticket for 
basically large scale SaaS supervised learning from things like video. We can we could plug a, a system on on you know YouTube or whatever video source that we have, have you watched videos all day, and then hope that by training itself to predict, it might in a hierarchical fashion, it might sort of come up with concepts like uh, that the world is three dimensional, that there are objects that are in front of others, that some objects can move independently, some objects are animate, and some objects are inanimate, uh, that objects are hidden behind other ones to exist, that you know objects that are not supported fall but because of gravity. You know all all the concepts that we learn when we were babies, right? Uh, and perhaps it's the collection of all of those concepts that uh, constitutes the basis for common sense. So if I see a path towards sort of more um, you know, human-like intelligence or more animal-like intelligence even, it would be through uh, something that does, you know, prediction of everything from everything else, which is the principle of, of self-supervised learning, but probably trained from video and, you know, would learn uh, not just representations, but also learn to predict uh, because prediction is really the essence of intelligence. And, and, and you know, you could, you could see this, uh, this uh, this the system here this this predictor here that looks at a video and predicts the next uh, segment of video or represents the uh, computer representation of the next uh, segment of video as as a forward a forward model okay a forward model you can use uh, for planning for uh, you know deciding how to act and things like this uh, in fact you can imagine that one input to this is the action you you're taking so I'm taking an action and it's going to affect the world. And so the why I'm going to observe because of the action I take is going to change. And uh, you know, my, my predictor might predict uh, what, uh, how the world is going to be affected by my, my action. And if I have that, that's a forward model. Um, so why is it good to have forward models? Uh, so you've seen examples of this you know, in the truck backer upper and things of that type, right? That Alfredo talked about. Um, but there is sort of a, a general architecture of an autonomous intelligence system that relies on having a predictive model of the world. Okay, so you want you want a predictive model. A predictive world model in your in your in your intelligent agent, right? And by the way, you, you have this in your brain, okay? Your entire prefrontal cortex, the, the front half of your, of your brain essentially does this, okay? It predicts. Um, at the bottom of your brain, you have an objective, okay? It's like a cost function. So what you have is a piece of your brain that at the base of your brain, it's actually called the basal ganglia, um, or at least it's located in the basal ganglia. Basal ganglia is an anatomical name. Um, but you have a piece of your brain that computes whether you are happy or not, whether you are comfortable or uncomfortable, whether you are hungry or not, whether you're thirsty or not, whether you're hurting or not, okay? So things that are instantaneous, right? They, they tell you right now, I'm not in a good state. You, you know, it takes the your the internal state of your of your brain, and it basically measures how, how happy you are. Okay, instantaneously. So if someone pinches you, this thing lights up because uh, it hurts. Uh, but simultaneously with this, you also have another module. So I'm not using the usual symbolism in you know in terms of circles and squares, but but you have a, a, another module which you could call a critic. And what the critic does is that it tries to predict the, the long-term value of the objective, okay? So basically it's a predictor, it's a, a temporal predictor for what the objective will, will tell me. So if, uh, if the first time we meet, I approach you, uh, I, you know, I pinch you, let's say, okay? I'm not gonna punch you in the face, I'm not that nasty. Um, but let's say I pinch you, which would be completely inappropriate. Um, the second time you see me, you're probably going to stay away from me, okay? Because uh, your critic is going to predict that, you know, it's likely that bad things will happen because by the time you got hurt. Um, or at least it wasn't pleasant. Okay, so you're going you're gonna to back out. 
And it's, it's your critic. Your critic makes a prediction as to the fact that you're not going to be happy uh, because of the situation, right? Um, it could rely on your predictive model, but it also uh, can rely on prediction of just how happy the, the state of the, your state is, is going to be. Okay, so if you have uh, a predictive world model and an objective or a critic, all of which are computed by your brain, right? They're not things that are given to you from the outside. Now, your, your, the objective cost gets external inputs, like, like you know, your pain detectors, right? And, uh, and also proprioceptive inputs like your, um, you know, whether you're tired or not, whether you're hungry or not, or whether you're thirsty or not. You know, kind of internal sensors, if you want. And they compute the instantaneous cost. But um, this is actually more like a, like a function. Um, and you can, the output of that cost, you know, can be seen as kind of a target for the critic. So the critic might try to predict future values of the of the objective. Um, and it and the critic uses the output from the from the predictive model to do this. Okay. <clears throat> so that's where kind of reinforcement learning occurs, if you want. Okay. Um, now what you need also is an actor. And so the actor is the thing that pro proposes uh, actions, action sequences that you feed to your predictive mo world model, uh, which allows your predictive world model to predict what's gonna happen uh, and whether those outcomes are gonna be good or bad using the critic, okay? Um, so the actor proposes a sequence of actions. You run those sequence of actions in your predictive world model. You imagine what's gonna happen as a consequence of your actions. OK. Uh, and then the predictive world models predicts what the sequence of states of the, of the world is going to be. OK, this is your internal world model predicting the state of the world. And now the critic can tell you this is good or bad. OK, and so the actor by gradient descent or something like that, you know, by optimization, can try to find a sequence of action that minimizes the uh, overall uh, cost computed by the critic, possibly even the cost that computed by the objective. Um, you know, can take the critic into account. Now, everything here is differentiable. So this is like, uh, this is an example of uh, model predictive co uh, control, which you've heard about from Alfredo. Um, but there is a lot of tasks that are really repetitive, right? So you, you learn a particular task of, I don't know, you know, building a, building a chair or something or selling or, or, you know, a task that require a little bit of kind of uh, knowledge of how the world works around you and, and, and what would be the consequences of your actions. And as you practice or driving, and as you practice more and more, you don't need to become as attentive about it um, as you were initially. And it's because this whole deliberate process uh, gets automated essentially. Okay, so that suggests, um, so first of all, there's another module that is super important, um, which is perception. And perception looks at, you know, the external world, let's call this X, and basically tells you uh, an estimate of the current state of the world. So that goes into initializing your world model, okay? But here's this other thing. The other thing is uh, that I was just mentioning, it's uh, we'll call this a policy uh, in psychology, this is, this is called system one. Whereas this, the entire rest is called system two. So a policy, the system one policy takes the estimate of the state of the world given by perception, okay? And directly sends uh, an action to the motor system. So this is why, if you want, I mean, this is, this is the motor system. Uh, 
Uh, whereas in the system two, it's the actor that produces the sequence of action that goes to the motor system. Okay. So uh, I'm gonna run. I'm gonna run out of colors here, but you could think of all this. The, the yellow the yellow stuff as what's called uh, system two or it's called um, you know planning uh, conscious uh, action conscious behavior etc. So system two is a term by uh, an economics Nobel Prize winner, Daniel Kahneman. Uh, who wrote this uh, little book called uh, Thinking F Fast and Slow. And so the system two is the one they use, you know, for uh, deliberate planning. And, and system one is 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 basically just this part okay so once you've uh, learned um so basically the way you train this uh this this uh this system one policy is that you train it by measuring the distance between the actions that have been planned okay and the actions that are produced by the policy so the policy is trying to just match the actions that uh, have, are the result of, of planning, okay? Um, so that it can learn, uh, um, it can directly compute an action from uh, the, an estimate of the set of the world from perception without having to go through a whole phase of predicting and planning, okay? So it's basically, you can think of it as, uh, as uh, amortized inference for the entire autonomous intelligence system. Okay, so your system two arrives at a sequence of action through uh, optimization by planning and then kind of figuring out a, a good sequence of actions. And then you train your system one, um, which is you know a part of your cortex that is close to the motor, motor system, the, the uh, motor control areas to basically directly react. And so now you can do the task without having to plan, right? And this actually works in the human brain for even uh, tasks that you would think are very high level, like playing chess. If you play, um, if you play a chess game against uh, a grandmaster and you are not yourself a grandmaster, the grandmaster doesn't have to think about how to play because you're an easy prey, right? So they will just look at the board and you know instinctively kind of move the the thing. It's not challenging to them. Uh, so that's basically just system one. It's just pattern recognition. Uh, they compiled that because you know they've 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 they played so much. But to you, you know, you're gonna have to spend 20 minutes per you know per turn because you know it's challenging. So you're gonna have to do the tree exploration and all that stuff. Okay, so that would be the architecture of an autonomous intelligent system. Uh, there are a few things that we don't know how to do in there. So. And, and the main thing is really learning predictive world models. That's really what we don't know how to do, particularly in the co in the context of uh, prediction with uncertainty. So that's uh, that's what we need to to solve. Okay, um, I'm going to stop here, and uh, I think now is time to hear about the best projects, the projects that got the best uh, results. Uh, and I want to watch those videos. <laughs> it's a surprise to me. I only watch one. Okay. Um, I didn't know you were just finishing right now. <laughs> One sec. Uh, slides. I intended to have a Q&A, but um, I took too long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do. We do. We may have some time, actually. We have like 50 uh, minutes, 45 minutes right now. So we still have. We still have some time maybe for a Q&A at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, we start with actually a slide. I'm going to be cropping the bottom part so you don't see who won at the beginning. <laughs> All right, so virtual poster session, deep learning 20, spring 2021. Uh, thanks, Jachen, for putting together these slides uh, <laughs> and also the, the whole competition and it's been taking care of everything. I, I, 
for, for this challenge. So, you know, credits to him. Anyway, so we start with this diagram, right? So we can clearly see there is there are five major uh, groups on the left hand side who have, uh, you know, a quite large uh, um, sc uh, score, right? Above 40%. Uh, we can see that um, there are several groups like this group over here. So at the, uh, at the end of the slide, you're gonna see also the numbers. Now we don't see the numbers, right? We see that someone actually really benefit from the uh, additional labels. Uh, perhaps this didn't quite uh, use too well the unlabeled data, I would say, no, it's like comparable to a team down here. Uh, whereas other teams like this one perhaps managed to do uh, quite well on the with the unsupervised part, but also got a major contribution from these additional labels. And of course, the winning, uh, winning team got both like the major uh, accuracy from the unsupervised plus a also decent contribution for uh, the additional labels, right? And so let's start with team number, uh, well, I don't know the number, the, the minus like five to top, right? We're gonna be going, we're gonna be listening and watching the presentation of these top five teams. And we're gonna have a question, a few questions from, uh, from, from the creators if they are around, okay? So we start team uh, in fifth position. Oh, boom. We have team 18, uh, Jerry, uh, which has the testing accuracy uh, of 41.66, right? So it's over here with the unlabeled part. And then with the 44.22 with the extra labels, right? So we go up to here. And so we're gonna be now watching the uh, Jerry team. So team 18. Hello everyone. Today, we will be presenting our approach to self-supervised learning on the image dataset provided in this competition. Oftentimes, we have very limited training dataset available in the real world. But by using self-supervised algorithms, we can learn useful features from the unlabeled dataset also. In a general SSL training, the model is trained on an unlabeled dataset using a pre-test task and then later fine-tuned on the labeled dataset. Another task was to select a subset of images for which we used the active learning approach using core set, which we chooses the best representative examples in our dataset. For our task of SSL, we went with Barlow twins. But the question comes, why Barlow twins? The factors that we need to consider before choosing a model is the amount of compute resources available and the objective function. With contrastive methods like MoCo and SimClear, they need large negative samples for good learning of features, thereby requiring large batch size and hence more compute. Barlow Twins comes up with a solution with the objective of reduction of redundancy and having invariant features. As it doesn't require large negative samples, it doesn't lose its performance on lower batch sizes. So in the basic Barlow Twins pipeline, we have two augmented versions of the same images, which goes through Resident 50 architectures and creates a cross correlation matrix of the representations. The output matrix should be as close as to an identity matrix as possible. In the loss function, we have an invariance term which increases the correlation for the on diagonal terms and the redundancy reduction term which punishes cross correlation between the off diagonal terms. The lambda parameter here acts as the weight of the off diagonal terms to balance each loss. On this slide, we visualize the features learned from the Barlow Twins SSL method. On the top right is the feature map of the middle layer of the encoder. Here it displays features of the legs of the monkey and the body of the monkey. On the bottom right is the saliency map. White pixels represent the most important 10 pixels uh, cells from the input to the output. Despite only being trained with the SSL on the encoder, it has learned wh exactly where the subject of the image is. For our labeling request, we adopt the core set approach. The objective of the core set approach is to minimize the average distance between any image and its nearest neighbor image request that we request a label for. By minimizing this value, we are also minimizing the difference between the full unlabeled data set and the subset of, of images that we request the data for. This is achieved by taking the full unlabeled data set, passing it through the encoder to get a set of embeddings using PCA for compression and breaking it up into 12,800 clusters with the k-means algorithm. Then, then the image closest to the center of each of these clusters becomes your subset of images that you request labels for. 
Supervised learning fine tune. We train a linear classifier on the label dataset on top of fine tuned representations of a ResNet 50 model pre trained with Parlor Twins method. For data augmentation, we used flips and random crops. For better conversions, we used cosine annealing learning rate scheduler. And to increase speed, we used distributed data parallel training. As we can see, there is good convergence in classification. Saliency maps well to the subject matter in most cases. We have cases of good examples and bad examples shown here, wherein for the bad examples, we can see that the model fails to distinguish background objects and the object in focus. We ran several contrastive methods on the dataset and concluded that Parlor Twins gives better results at lower batch size as compared to Moco and Sinclair. Overall, Parlor Twins gave 41.75% accuracy for the original dataset and 44.45% accuracy for the dataset with extra labels. Okay, that was great, I think. Um, do we have questions for this, for team 18? Uh, anyone in class or Jan, or do we have feedback for team 18, Jan? If Jan is still around. <laughs> Great. Okay. Yeah, of course, I'm around. Okay. Um, no, I didn't see the, the <laughs> camera. No, this is great. I mean, you know, you, you're probably like the, I would say, the fourth or fifth team in the world to actually use Barlow Twins. Okay. So, very few people have, uh, you know, really played with it because it's so new. Do we have uh, questions from anyone from class for this team? I'm checking the chat. If not, we are going to be moving to the uh, fourth position. Uh, how many epochs did you train uh, has been asked here? Uh, yeah, but I guess I cannot. Yes, you can speak. Of course, <laughs> it's easier for me to, to read everything. <laughs> yeah, because it takes time to write every answer. So uh, for uh, Barrow Twins, we trained for around 200 epochs. And the particular augmentation strategy that we used were uh, the basic default given in the paper itself. So there was a color jitter, um, random noise, um, Gaussian blurring, and random rotation, and uh, the flips. And did you train other SSL techniques to a similar number of epochs as Barlow? So uh, no, we first went with Simcl uh, Simclear, and we tried to train it for 200 at first but we only could reach till 28. We tried for 300 and 400, but it didn't in increase that much because our batch size was small. But uh, then we went with Balo Twins and we saw better convergence at uh, 200 epochs than other methods. Cool. Uh, thank you, Raul. All right, so moving on in uh, fourth position, we have team number four. Super serious learners. Mm, okay, these are serious people. Uh, we have 44.8 uh, at the beginning, right? So we have like a, a rather larger improvement, right? In terms of unsupervised and actually is superior to the third position team. Uh, and then further improvement with the uh, unlabeled, with a, with a few additional labels, right? So this is team number four. <laughs> and we're gonna be watching now the video. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our project presentation for deep learning. I'm Amber Tang, and I'm joined by my teammates, Pat Moon and Doug Anpi, and today we will talk about our MOCO model. For this project, our team used momentum contrast for unsupervised learning. In particular, MOCO has been shown to be effective in unsupervised visual representation learning tasks because of its self-supervised nature and its use of contrastive laws to build a discrete dictionary on high-dimensional continuous outputs. Contrastive loss methods can be thought of as ways to build dynamic dictionaries and that measure the similarities of sample pairs in representation space. This dictionary is said to be dynamic in the sense that the keys are randomly sampled and the key encoder evolves during training. To look deeper into contrastive learning and loss functions, which are two core parts of MOCO, I'll be handing it off to my teammate Dukan. As we heard from Angela, MOCO has two encoders, one for the query and another one for the keys in the dictionary. The info NCE loss function captures it. It is a contrastive loss function whose value is low when the query Q is similar to its positive key and dissimilar to all the other keys. To achieve similar key encoders, Moco implements the key encoder as a momentum-based update where M is kept quite close to 1 and all the parameters theta Q are updated in the backpropagation 
which ensures that we obtain the encoded keys at different times from similar encoders. Specifically, we are using an improved version of MoCo, MoCo version 2. It adopts some design improvements from SimCLR, adding a multi-layered perceptron head using augmentations in figure 2 and um, a cosine learning rate schedule. For the XR labeling, we trained our model on the training data set, then determined the most likely class for each unlabeled data, sort them by the probabilities and choose the instances with the lowest probability. So at the end, we have the instances the model is least certain of. We use active learning pool-based sampling with the least confident query strategy. Hi, my name is Fat Nguyen, and I'm going to talk about our training procedure. To utilize all images available to us for training, we combine the images from both the unlabeled and the trained data set to do retraining. The image augmentations we used for retraining are similar to the ones used by MoCo version 2 for ImageNet, such as random crop, color distort, and Gaussian blur. We also calculated the mean and standard deviation of this image data set, which is slightly different from those of ImageNet to be used for normalization. Next, I will talk about our cell supervised settings. The model we use for the MoCo encoders is ResNet 50. We found out that the ResNet 50 model achieves significantly better performance than smaller networks while having reasonable training time. We trained the model with a batch size of 512 on a system with two GPUs. We chose the SGD optimizer using an initial learning rate of 0.06 and a cosine annealing scheduler. Although the 2 GPU system allows a much larger path size, we found them to be less stable than the chosen value. The model is trained for 1000 epochs, and each epoch took about 13 minutes to train on the GCP system. For the classified training, we use the SGD optimizer with an initial learning rate of 10, again with the cosine scheduler. When training with extra labels, we increase the learning rate to Trinity. We used a midi batch size of 256 and trained the model on one GPU for 20 epochs. Finally, we achieved a validation set accuracy of 45% and 46.4% when using extra labels. We also showed the previous leaderboard test accuracy. All right, what's the reason for using learning rate equal 10 for the classifier? I'm just reading a question from Youngju. Uh, so we are only training one uh, layer for the classifier. So, and it is overfitting very fast. So we are training for only a short epoch, uh, amount of epochs. So 10 is, uh, uh, after hyper tuning, 10 is the uh, value we found to be uh, most successful. Okay, I didn't actually quite get uh, exactly how you select the active samples. Um, sorry, do you mean the uh, the data, okay. data set for pre-training? Or how you select the samples for which you ask the, for the labels? Yeah, we just um, like train our model um, and calculate the most probable um, class for each unlabeled data. And from that, we choose the least um, certain of or least probability one. Okay. So the one that has like the, so is it based on the, on the maximum sc score? Like you select the ones with the lowest maximum score or is it based on the entropy of the distribution? Or yeah, the, we, we choose like the maximum probability for, for maximum. each class, for each late unlabeled data and then sorted by, by the probability. I see. Okay. Thanks. Okay, okay, sorry, I was muted. I didn't figure uh, too many buttons here. Um, then after number four, we have uh, this other team, which is worse in terms of unsupervised performance, but then with the, the catch up, the caught up with the actually uh, larger improvement due to the actual annotated uh, images, which is team number, oh, drum, uh, drum, drum roll. Uh, team number 15, lossless, uh, with a 43.34 um, initial accuracy, right? So lower here. And then we have this uh, 47.63, okay? And so let's watch lossless uh, 
<laughs> the last less the team 15 video hi this is the video submission for team 15 to start with the task we looked at the data set and tried to find similarities between images for example checking whether the subject is centered which turned out to be the case for a couple of classes for like what we assume to be water tank and animals but not so much for classes like room this was done to see what sort of augmentations we could use to extend the training set. Secondly, we wanted to pick the right architecture. Initially, we utilized smaller architectures because the training set was small. But as we moved on to SSL techniques, we realized that the smaller models weren't able to capture all the information. So we moved on to a deeper architecture. ResNet 34 gave a significant bump in performance. We modified its last and first convolution layer to better adapt to our smaller image sizes and that gave us another boost of around 3-4%. to We tried deeper architectures but they wouldn't fit on our single GPU. Moving on to the pre-training methods we tried. We divided each of the techniques listed here amongst the three of us. However, with every other technique apart from Barlow, we ran into an upper limit of what the model could learn. For SimCLR, we reached a point where training the model further, in fact, gave a reduced accuracy. As for Barlow, we played around with the augmentations. For example, Gaussian Blur improved the performance despite the larger training time. A key observation which we found interesting was that the standard ResNet uh, finished training in five days for 1000 epochs, whereas the custom ResNet took around nine days despite having a lesser number of parameters. To build the classifier itself, we took the backbone we trained from Barlow and experimented with a different number of fully connected layers on top of it. The sweet spot was two layers with ReLU in the middle so as to project the embeddings into a higher dimension before giving class scores. To juice out a little bit of extra performance from the classifier, we used pseudo labeling. We evaluated this approach by checking how many confident images are correctly labeled on a validation set. This was done to find the percentage of data we should skim off our unlabeled set. In the highest 3% of the data, 90% of the images were predicted correctly. Thus, we made the model predict on the unlabeled set and used the images with the highest confidence scores along with their predicted labels to train the model further. We did this three times, each time taking 3% of the unlabeled set while reducing the learning rate by a factor of 10. We did something similar for our labeling request too. We sorted based on the difference in the scores of the top two predicted classes of each image in order to prevent outliers by just taking the confidence scores. Taking the top, top 100,000 images in this manner, we got their image embeddings using our backbone and clustered them using k-means into 800 different classes. We picked the top 16 images from each of the cluster to ensure an even distribution. This was done using all the models we had generated up to this point, with each model having a vote based on how well it performs. The main points where we saw huge bumps in accuracy was moving to a deeper architecture, training Barlow for a higher number of epochs, utilizing dropout between to the two fully connected layers, and using weight decay in the optimizer. Great. So are there questions for team number 15? And if team number 15 members are uh, with us, they can unmute themselves to reply to these questions. Yeah, this is cute. I mean, both the the kind of self-learning technique to kind of use the, uh, you know, to use pseudo-label from the unlabeled data. Um, it's interesting that it works, um, but it's a cute, it's a cute, um, it's a good idea to use this in this context. Uh, this, this, this would qualify as semi-supervised running, I suppose. Um, and then the, the way to select the active samples also is, is quite nice. Jeffrey is asking, uh, did you did you do any specific compression to the k-mean algorithm for all labeled? Uh, we found one half a million is hard to solve for your computer. Half a million, yeah. 
Um, no, actually, it, uh, the k-means took a lot of time. We tried a couple of different k-means algorithms, and we wanted something standard. And I've worked on k-means earlier, and Scikit does pretty well um, to optimize whatever k-means is there. And it ra- it ran in around half an hour, um, and I think that was enough. We didn't have to do sort of any sort of compression. Um, and as for the pseudo labeling thing, it it was very finicky in the beginning. Um, so. When we we were just using ResNet 18, um, the accuracy actually dropped pretty fast, uh, and we weren't seeing any improvements. So, uh, but when we switched our architecture to ResNet 34, uh, then um, we could see like an increase of around two to three percent using pseudo labeling. And we just have to make sure that like each time when we were skimming off data from uh, the um, like the unlabeled set, we were applying the same augmentations you were doing to the training set. Otherwise, it tended to overfit. I see. Awesome. Thank you. All right, moving on. Uh, next team we see. So we are in a. So we this was team fifteen, right? So we have now the top two, I guess. So we go into oh drum roll. Uh, we have team number twenty. So team number 20, ABC, one, two, three. Okay, this is super uh, ingenious name, I guess. But okay, just kidding. We have a testing set accuracy of 50.51. I think it's the first one over 50. And then uh, slightly better, well, very lightly, slightly better with the annotated uh, data, right? So we can see here, uh, basically almost no improvement with the additional part. Anyway, so let's, have a look to Team 20 video. Hello, Alp and our fallen TAs. We're Team ABC123, and our team members are D, Song Yun, myself, Colin, and here are today's content. Here are the self supervised learning methodologies we try to leverage the unlabeled data set. The first two methodologies share a similar structure. The data is pushed through a feature extraction network before contrasting the positive and negative samples. However, they require either a large batch size or large memory to be effective. The autoencoder learns the feature in the encoder section. One can train a classifier with set features afterwards. In our experiments, even though the model has good reconstructions, the features learned are not useful for classification. The last one is pseudo labeling. For a given unlabeled data set, the network minimizes the difference between prediction of a strongly augmented version and a weak augmented version. And then for a labeled data set, the network minimizes the classification loss. In order to select the data that uh, best benefit our model, we computed the entropy of the data prediction and selected the ones with the highest entropy. In other words, the extra label comes from the data that our model is least confident about. Now I'm going to illustrate the framework of Comatch. Different from most existing semi-supervised learning method, Comatch jointly learns the encoder F and the classification head H and the projection head G and jointly optimize three losses, a supervised classification loss on labeled data, an unsupervised classification loss on unlabeled data, and a contrastive loss. In Comatch, the high dimensional feature of each sample is transformed to class probability P and is normalized low dimensional embedding Z. Given label samples, we firstly perform memory smooth pseudo labeling on weak argumentations, which reduces confirmation bias by leveraging the structure of the embeddings. Then it constructs a pseudo label graph WQ, which defines the similarity of label samples. Now let's look at the model results. We've trained the data using several architectures. Notice that Comatch achieved the best accuracy in both 5% labeled dataset and 7.5% labeled dataset in 400 epochs. Also, it is efficient to train Comatch compared to other models, such as SemiClear. So the confusion matrix of our prediction we know the accuracy and recall is high at the training set, but relatively low at the validation set. The third plot shows that the prediction of the training set is very balanced. However, for the validation set, we can see there are some underclassified labels at the bottom left and some overclassified labels at the upper right. 
Let's first look at what our model learned. Given the butterfly image, our model successfully detected the shape and texture of wings and also background flowers. Then let's look at what our model failed to learn. The first type is underclassified levels, as we mentioned before, such as shield and hand centered. They have challenging characters like skill variation and intra-class variation. The second type is overclassified levels, like computer and comic book cover. The feature of computers are very general, like rectangle. And covers of comic books are very flexible. They can be any object. In the future, we will pay more attention to those challenging classes and get our model improved. Thanks for listening. Great, Team 20 did very well. Uh, do we have questions for Team 20? And if Team 20 members are around, they can unmute themselves and take the questions. So Sami Supervised Running is still in the race. That's uh, interesting to hear. Mm -hmm. Do you think Comatch is well trained? Jan is uh, asking. Uh, we set the training um, horizon to about 400 epochs uh, because of the limited computer resource. Um, and we used a cosine decrease in the learning rate. So in the end, the learning curve did um, converge. But uh, we're not sure if we extended the training horizon, whether the accuracy will keep going up or not. OK. Actually, yeah. I have a question. Do you have um, any sense of whether other teams got similar results uh, as you with uh, Barlow Twins? So you had a table with some results for Barlow Twins, which were pretty bad, like 20, 25% or something. Um, so anybody else there um, got similar numbers? I'm trying to figure out whether those numbers are are good for Barlow Twins, or like would you, what you would expect for Barlow Twins, or, or whether other people got like better better results. Hi, Jan. I, I, we actually use the Battle Twins, but I think even the training app probes is pretty large for our case. It still cannot compete with the core match uh, score they reported. So yeah. Is there is there any any uh, any hint that some combination? I mean, they're kind of complementary, right? I mean, because one is semi supervised, the other one is self supervised. So do you think they could be combined somehow? Uh, I think the comet structure itself contains some um, contrasted learning structure, like in the slow label graph and the embedding graph, they're essentially trying to you know, push up on the probability of having the same um, image and then push down on the ones that have different, even though it's not as clear as in the contrasted learning models, they do have an element within the model itself. Right. Okay, then moving to the last team, and then we're going to have a few questions for Rian. So actually, we are going to be asking something. So we go here, right? This was team 20, if I'm not mistaken. So on the top of the leaderboard. Ah, <laughs> team number two, Mio, Ned. <laughs> Uh, with a testing accuracy of 55.8 uh, with the unsupervised part and then with the testing accuracy of 57. So uh, one and a half point uh, above basically for the uh, when using the full uh, when using the full part now with the, also with the labels. So let's see the videos of team number two. Congratulations team number two. You won. <laughs> Hi, my name is Yang from Team 2 Mionet. In this video, Wenjie, Qingfu, and I will introduce our method, which achieved 56.02% top point accuracy on the validation dataset with only 0.5% of the data. In our method, we utilize the battle twins as the unsupervised learning method. It constructs a cross correlation matrix from two representations of different views of the same image. It encourages this cross correlation matrix to be a diagonal matrix. We utilize the fixed match as the semi supervised learning method. This method predicts the pseudo label from a weakly augmented image, and it does consistency regularization between this weakly augmented image and the strongly augmented image. In this slide, we'll introduce our method in details. First, we obtain a fish embedding from unsupervised learning with the battle twins, and then we do a balanced pseudo label iteration. 
In each iteration, we use the current best model to predict the probability of classes of each sample. Then we pick top k classes for each sample to generate the pool. We pick top p samples for each class from the pool, and we generate the pseudo labels. We fine tune our model with the pseudo labels plus the training dataset. And at last, we fine tune it only on the training dataset. We run it for four iterations and keep the k equal to 10 and increase the p from 200 to 500 along the way. In the third stage, we fine tune our model from semi supervised linear method with the fixed match. And we use the fixed match to further improve our model by training it with the training dataset and the additional dataset. Last but not least, we utilize the test time augmentation with the multi scale inference. We use the average of the prediction from the resized image. And we got our final score. For the label request task, we use a naive active learning method. We use k means with cosine similarity as the diversity sampling method to form 200 clusters from the whole unlabeled dataset. We use margin of confidence as the uncertainty sampling method to choose 64 samples from each cluster. Here, we choose visualization of different model weights. We choose final feature maps of the third residual block produced by ResNet50. So what's happening here is that given the input dog image, the feature maps on the right column are more concentrated on some key points of the dog, like the head and the legs, whereas on the left column, the activations are all around the entire image region, meaning that the features learned from the baseline Butler twins is less discriminative and less clear. Here are some interesting things we find after analyzing the top 625 images of each class. Some classes have lower accuracies because of class imbalance. We notice a drastic increase in errors after the first 300 images in the sewing machine class, indicating a lack of data. On the other hand, most classes with dogs have very high accuracies and we believe a high number of different dog classes in the training set teaches the model more refined features about dogs. Here, I would like to conclude what we learned from this competition. For the unsupervised learning, a large model, a large batch size, and a sufficient amount of training steps are crucial. For the student label iteration, you need to always search for a good learning rate at each step. And also, a balanced student label iteration will improve the model accuracy. For the semi supervised learning, the fixed match prefers a large ratio between the unlabeled data to the labeled data. And you can apply the EMA at the end of the training to smooth the model. In general, Observing the data after each stage and analyzing it helps us a lot. And don't forget, the test time augmentation is a free launch. Thank you for watching the video. It's definitely awesome. Both the video, the, the, the technique, and super cute as well, the final cut. <laughs> Do we have qu questions for the winning team? It's very nice work. Yeah, yeah it is really good. Uh, there is a question here. What is EMA, exponential moving average? So the EMA we're using is that uh, we assume that the model has been pretty well trained at the end of the training. So basically, we are actually uh, averaging the weights along the way. Basically, we are taking the weights from the last epoch and putting it with the weights about like 0 0.99 and added up the new weights we train at the current stage. So basically, it will help the model to converge uh, uh, well enough. If you if the model uh, the, the the initial model itself is good, but this kind of technique might have some issue if the your initial model weight is not good enough. How did you incorporate such a large batch size for battle twins? Oh, uh, so you can have different techniques. One technique you can apply will be the gradient accumulation. Uh, but uh, we were actually training on more GPUs that the uh, GCP was providing because we found out that the GCP cluster is uh, too slow for our approach. So we used uh, 1000 epoch to train the ResNet50 and the, the batch size is 1024 if you're looking back to the slide. Also, another issue is that we also tried the ResNet 18 comparing to the ResNet 50 at first. So actually, at the second bench, uh, at the second benchmark that we are releasing, we are actually still using the ResNet 18 with the BYOL, and the accuracy is around like 10, 20 percent. And we'll say, okay, we cannot go with that. So we switched to the ResNet 50, and it gave us a large boost. 
Yeah, the reason is that we actually got a pretty bad result at the first leaderboard. It's like a maybe ten percent. At the second leaderboard, we actually got an arrow, <laughs> and at the score at the second leaderboard, we are actually still around twenty percent. Sorry, we didn't mean to mean to avoid these two leaderboards. <laughs> So basically, for the unsupervised learning, we use 1,000 epochs. For the fixed match, we're actually using 40 epochs. For the balanced studio label iteration, for each iteration, we use the 40 epochs. So basically, for the, all the fine-tuned procedure, we all use the 40 epochs. Cool. So I'm no longer mute, I think. Yes, there are no questions. So we have questions for Jan instead. Uh, we have many questions for Jan. We're going to be asking a few questions if Jan is still with us. Sure. Okay. Jan, are you here? I'm here. Yes. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, another Jan. Sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> N instead of a G. Yes. <laughs> okay. It's not, it's not the first time I'm confused with someone called Jan. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here we go. My bad. Uh, I had to specify. Uh, the can, the big one, like the, all right. So, uh, question, what is, what is the recipe to follow for any deep learning problem? And during the competition also, we found that models are still a black box and we don't find a concrete reason why one model is working better than the other. Expect from the visualization of the filters. So how can we go about it? Um, yeah, so there is, the, the bad news is that there is no method. Um, well, there is a generic name for the method. It's called engineering. Uh, and it requires an ability called engineering knack. So what is it? It's the ability to foresee in advance if a solution you're proposing is going to work or not. So, uh, and again, it's related to something I just talked about uh, before, which is what is your model of the world? Is your internal mental model of, uh, of how things work accurate? Uh, enough to predict whether method a, architecture A is going to work better than architecture B, whether this trick is going to help or not. Um, so that's part of the, the story, kind of uh, intuition for what is going to work. And then uh, empirical validation. Uh, sometimes your intuition are proved wrong, happens to everybody, including me. Um, happens a lot to me, actually. <laughs> it's a, where, uh, you know, things I thought were true ended up not being true. Um, you have to accept that your intuitions are wrong. So, you know, in the face of overwhelming evidence, you should change your mental model. And that's the most difficult part. It's getting your mental model to fit reality. But that's how we get the gradients, right? So, well, yeah, exactly. One observation there, one observation on the other side, we, we get our understanding to change, you know, direction. Right. Uh, also, how important, how important a PhD is in applied AI research? Same person, well, so I will know. Yeah, um, it, it depends, it depends what your ambitions are. It depends what you are interested in, what type of work you're interested in. Uh, so if, you know, if you want to do like research research, um, which means uh, you want to be able to talk about what you do, um, you know, publish it in you know various places and things like that. So it doesn't mean, you know, it's not because you get a PhD necessarily that you get a research job. And it's not because you don't get a PhD, you don't get a research job. But it's much easier to get a research job if you do have a PhD, and uh, and it puts you in a you know better position to. Um, um, Kind of work on your own things, you know, invent your own technique as opposed to kind of reproducing other people's results, uh, things like that. So, if you are interested in sort of, um, you know, blazing new trails, uh, creating new algorithms, etc., you need to find uh, an environment where people will let you do this, and that means either a university or a public research lab or an industry research lab of the type that lets you work on your problems as opposed to work on their problems. And that pretty much more or less requires a PhD. Um, there are ways to do this without a PhD, which is to basically get hired as an engineer and work with other people that have PhDs, but, um, but it's a different kind of job you're doing. 
So Aditya he, comes from mine though, right? So he, he just had an undergraduate degree here at NYU and then he just published recently the DALI paper and he's a research, uh, yeah, I'm happens. not sure if he's a research engineer or. Uh, I mean, it happens, doesn't matter what the title, what your title is. Um, but, and there are, you know, a few research scientists at FAIR that uh, don't have PhDs. And there are, you know, a lot of research engineers at, at FAIR who do have PhDs and some that don't have a PhD, but basically do a research job. So, um, so you know, it's, it's somewhat flexible, but if you want to put your, the chances on your side, uh, you, you really want to do a PhD. Like, I know a lot of people who, I've met a lot of people who had the opportunity perhaps to do a PhD and, you know, basically chose not to, uh, or started one and never finished, or, you know, kind of never thought about it, really. Uh, and, and many of them, you know, told me that they regretted not doing it. I have never encountered anyone with a PhD who told me like, I really regret doing a PhD. I should have <laughs> not done it. Okay. Okay. So maybe we are shy. <laughs> Just kidding. That, that tells you something. Now, the thing is, you know, it's difficult to get into a PhD program. So, you know, it's, and it, it re, you know, it, it requires, you know, a bit of, you know, effort, abnegation, motivation, uh, a little bit of self-confidence that you're going to lose probably in the first year of your PhD and then slowly recover <laughs> as, as you go. Um, but you need to realize that you're probably, you know, uh, you, you're, you're, you're not, you know, less smart or whatever than a lot of people whose papers you read. Okay. Um, so, you know, don't have any inferiority complex. That's the, that's the thing. A few more questions. So, um, because people actually wrote them and upvote them. So we actually should ask them a few, I think while reading a paper in deep learning, we get to know about the successful hyperparameters for a given model. Usually how much do the publishers try and test to see if the model works? Uh, which is how many trials on average are undergone to finally get the desired result? <laughs> well, most of the time they don't tell you, okay? The authors like don't tell you how much effort they've, they've spent uh, trying to kind of tune their hyperparameters, you know, how much competition they use. Although now some conferences actually require authors to, to tell like how much computation, computation did you use? Um, because, you know, that sort of have to be taken into account, right? Um, if, uh, if you didn't get like, you know, record breaking results, but you know, you did it with, you know, two GPUs in your dorm room, you know, it counts for, but, but you got close to, you know, because of a good idea, I think that idea should be disseminate, disseminated when you compare yourself to, you know, a team of 10 people at Google who use 2000 GPUs for two weeks. Um, and did like systematic hyperparameter uh, search, you know, of course they're gonna get good results, right? But, um, but, but like, you know, which, which method in the end is, um, is kind of more interesting. So um, it's a trade-off, like, you know, both strategies are, are perfectly legitimate. You know, there, there, there is some value to completely sort of empirical search uh, uh, based on computation, but not everybody can do that. And so that's one reason why some conferences are asking now, like, you know, how much competition did that take? All right. So Doug Anne is asking, uh, what is the difference in deep learning research between a university and an industry like Facebook AI research? So uh, those two things are complementary, really. I, I don't see them as, you know, one being superior to the other. They're really complementary. It's, it's two different things. Um, and it depends a lot on the university and on the industry research lab. So first of all, what you have to realize is that uh, industry research lab that you hear about, whose results you, you've learned about, you know, over the last 50 years, if not the last century, there's only a handful of them, okay? Um, so the recent ones that you know about are, you know, Google, Facebook, you know, Facebook Air Research, Microsoft Research, uh, and you know, there's like sm smaller pockets of uh, interesting research going on at NVIDIA and Intel and, uh, and then, you know, bigger companies like IBM and NEC and things like that. But, um, and then of course, you know, uh, um, you know, Huawei, Baidu, you know, et cetera. Although most of the stuff they do is, is more applied, but they have like, you know, really good contributions to computer vision, for example. Um, so, uh, 
you know, in Yandex. I mean, there's like, you know, quite a few companies that are really present, but it's a relatively small number. Uh, and then you go back in, in, in the past, there was a period uh, during the late 90s, early 2000s, where, early 2000s, where basically the only company that had like a, a really good research lab where people were publishing and influencing the field was Microsoft, essentially. Um, uh, and then, you know, you go back uh, further, further up and there was, you know, AT&T Labs and before that Bell Labs and then IBM Research, which was, you know, very productive, Xerox Park, you know, back in the 1980s. Um, uh, et cetera, you know, General Electric even had a very interesting lab. Now you think about what all those labs come from. They're, they're all labs from very large companies that basically are very well established on their markets and do not need to fight for survival uh, from one quarter to the next, right? You cannot have research in a company that fights for survival because uh, there's just not enough resources, right? A, a company that, uh, you know, needs to, uh, find its place c cannot afford to invest in long-term research and probably cannot afford to kind of talk about what they, the research they do. They, so that's why you, you know, the, the good research labs are only in very large companies that are profitable and, uh, you know, well-established uh, in their market and, you know, make over, you know, 20 billion of revenue or something like this. I mean, it's not a fixed number, but, uh, uh, but that's, that's the thing. Now, uh, the kind of research that takes place there, there are some labs that are very bottom up. So FAIR, uh, FAIR actually has, is, has two sub organizations, one called FAIR Labs, the other one called FAIR XL. And FAIR XL has kind of slightly more organized projects um, where with teams and, and that are managed and everything. Whereas FAIR Labs is very bottom up. It's, it's you know, scientist driven research. Um, there's a lot of collaborations and everything, but it's, you know, it's, it's sort of very uh, organized chaos, if you want. Uh, Bell Labs used to be like that as well. Uh, Bell Labs research, at least the research part. Uh, so this is very, you know, somewhat similar to the kind of research you would do in in, uh, in academia, except the incentives are slightly different. So in academia, most projects have students and postdocs, and the most the main motivation for them uh, is to get you know get papers out so they can get a job at the end, okay, <laughs> when they graduate or when they, their postdoc uh, ends. Uh, and so you will work on sort of opportunity projects that you know may not have a very you know, bright future. It might be a dead end, but you know you're gonna get a paper out of it, so you can work on this, right? Uh, you can work on theory that may be irrelevant, but it will get you a paper and you know, some theoretical conference, machine learning conference like Colt or something, uh, because it's you know, brilliant mathematics, even though it may be completely irrelevant in practice. Um, so the motivation there is different. In industry, you tend to work on things that you know eventually, maybe in the very long term, but eventually are gonna be useful. So uh, you tend to be less opportunistic. You tend to have more of a, a long-term goal and then work towards that goal. But it's uh, but in organization like, like Fair Labs, it's kind of more, it's self-motivated, uh, uh, self, uh, it's, it's self if you want, right? Uh, Microsoft research is, is very similar. Um, Google has small pockets like Google Brain, uh, some parts of Google Brain where it's kind of bottom up and a little self-organized. Most other places of uh, kind of Google research and, and Google AI are much more organized and top down. DeepMind also has some pockets that are very bottom up and a lot of it is uh, more like Fair Labs, more kind of organized. Uh, so it's, it's different style. You, you won't find those organized groups in academia very much. Last two questions, then we say goodbye. It's going to be the question from Colin. Uh, do theoretical proofs still matter in industry? So very connected to what you were talking about. For example, yeah, under yeah. some conditions to ensure some kind of property of network. It seems most of recent works are formulated from intuition and stacking different Lego, blo uh, Lego blocks together. Well, okay, so the, uh, I actually have a whole talk about this, uh, about the this title is the epistemology of, of deep learning. I gave that talk at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton a few years ago, and it's, uh, it's on YouTube, you can, you can watch it. It's called the epistemology of deep learning. Um, and, you know, it talks about the, the relative importance and the relationship between empirical science um, and, 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 and kind of more the the, the, the I mean, empirical discoveries as well as uh, sort of theoretical discoveries and the relationship between uh, science and technology. So uh, 
you know, deep learning is part of computer science and, and it's an engineering science. So in engineering science, you're not studying nature, you are inventing new artifacts and then you're using the, the, sci the science, scientific method to analyze and, and, and uh, explain and predict, you know, uh, analyze what you observe in those artifacts. Um, and it's very often the case in the history of uh, science and technology that the invention of the artifact precedes the development of the science that explains it. So a good example of this airplane. is the invention, airplane. the airplane, but a better example may maybe even is the, uh, the steam engine. So the steam engine was invented in the late 1600s. Uh, and it was, you know, developed empirically, essentially, with engineers, you know, and people who are kind of inventive uh, for about 100 years before people developed thermodynamics uh, with the uh, idea of the Carnot cycle and the context of the, the concept of entropy and, and all that stuff. And the fact that, you know, you have uh, a limit in the efficiency of, uh, of a Carnot cycle. Um, due to difference in temperatures of two sources of temperature, and you have the second principle of thermodynamics, and you can't have, um, uh, a, a, you know, perpetual motion. And you need, um, if you want to have a thermal engine, you have to have two, you know, two bodies with different temperatures, basically. So um, since they don't occur naturally, you have to basically heat one of them. Uh, so things like that, right? And you know, thermodynamics became uh, one of the like most important theoretical construct intellectual construct and theoretical foundations of all of science, right? All of science uses thermodynamics one way or another. Uh, and uh, in fact, some of the methods that we talked about, like variational inference and stuff like that, they use all the mathematics that come from thermodynamics. So um, uh, so, so it's very often the, 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 the case that an artifact gets invented before the theory for it gets developed. And we're in a bit of that situation with deep learning, where there is a lot of theory that pertains to deep learning, um, that, for example, gives the limit of machine learning, right? I mean, the uh, statistical learning theory, the vatnik chervonenkis type uh, uh, theory, uh, tells you the limit of what you can do with machine learning. It tells you if you have a completely general machine that is infinitely powerful, can, could learn, in principle, anything, it cannot learn anything without a huge amount of data. So necessarily, you need to have either, you know, regularization or, uh, or, or some other way of kind of restricting the set of functions that, the learning machine can can uh, can realize or can implement, uh, and you know, deep learning breaks some of the stuff that uh, uh, you know theoretical results that you read in you read in the statistical literature, uh, because you know in deep learning we train gigantic networks, gigantic models with tons of parameters, only a relatively small amount of data, and they still work. And it's a bit of a there's a lot of work on the theory of that. It's a, a little bit of a theoretical mystery, but less and less now. I mean, it's more and more understood why, why this works, uh, but it pretty much invalidates a lot of stuff you read in statistical uh, books, you know, textbooks. Uh, so I, I wouldn't say it's completely empirical. I think the probably the best work in deep learning, and some of it is completely, you know, empirical, people stumbling on kind of new architectures because of intuition and things like that. But a lot of it is also, you know, intuition driven by uh, theoretical arguments. And I think the role of theory is mostly to tell you what's impossible. Uh, it's not the case that the theory will tell you, here is, you here is how you design a deep learning system. But it will tell you, like, you know, there are limits to like, how well it can work, regardless of which architecture you use. And so there's no point trying to search for an architecture that's universal, for example, or something like that, right? Uh, there's a lot of work on like, you know, graph neural nets, you know, uh, equivariance and invariance on 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 under groups and manifolds. And there's a lot of theories to be to be done, and I, I find it absolutely fascinating. Last question. Next question. Then we say goodbye. Uh, actually, I'm picking one that, because we already answered one here. So, how to encode non-model physical constraints prior knowledge expert systems in a learning-based method? Can we do it using self-supervised learning for robotic systems? Well, um, okay, so here, here's a question for robotic systems. So robotic systems, uh, if you have a robot arm, for example, you can, you can write down the equations, the dynamical equations of this robot arm. Uh, they're not that simple, but you can write them down. Uh, and if it, that gives you a, a predictive model that you know, tells you if, if you put this action in this arm, uh, you know, it's gonna move in this direction at that speed, you know, whatever. And, you, and, and so you can use this as a predictive model. If you write it properly, it's differentiable. 
So you can use it for planning. And in fact, it's a standard way of doing planning in robotics uh, using model predictive control. We, we have done this two weeks ago. So, yeah. That's right. And, uh, you know, a lot of things you see, uh, those impressive videos from Boston Dynamics and everything, you know, they use a lot of that with a lot of other techniques, of course, that are much more uh, sophisticated to, you know, take into account the like changing conditions and stuff like that. Um, but here is the problem. Uh, if you want to like control a robot that grasps an object or, or, you know, or does things like this, like pushes an object to arrange them in a particular way or, or puts, you know, a, a, a screw in a, in a hole or like a, a rod in, inside of a hole and it's just, uh, just the right size. There are heuristics you have to use to be able to do this. And the simulators don't work for this. So a simulator does not simulate friction very well, usually. Uh, it's not very accurate. And so if you plan purely in simulation, when you transfer it to your real system, it's not going to be accurate uh, because, the, because the simulation is not perfect. So what do you do when you do this, when, when you are faced with that situation? What you have to do probably is uh, you know, build your internal model of the robot. You start it with a kind of physics-based model. Uh, but then you add some free parameters to it, and then maybe you add a little ne neural net on the side, uh, you know, for some of the parts of that model, so that the system can uh, adapt uh, the parameters of that model and make it more accurate in situations where the the, the pure simulator itself would not would not be. Um, that that's one way. Now, uh, for the more general question of like, if you have knowledge like in the form of rules and facts and things like this, how do you incorporate this into into an neural net. I think the best bet for this would be things that are based on uh, large-scale associative memories or information retrieval, right? So you might have like a large collection of uh, knowledge in the form of text or in the form of, you know, text that has been reduced to kind of statements. And uh, you can uh, embed them in a vector space. And then you can do kind of search in that in that vector space whenever you need to, your system needs to answer a question or refer to uh, a particular piece of knowledge, you can do a sort of associative retrieval. Uh, and we've seen how to do this with those kind of soft associative memories. Uh, there's quite a lot of uh, work on this at the moment, and, and you could think of transformers that's kind of exploiting this to some extent. But, um, but, but you know, people working on dialogue systems that use large scale uh, memories, associative memories, basically, as, as, a, as knowledge bases. Okay, I think that was it for this year semester, actually. Um, thank you, Jan, for being with us and telling us all these nice things. And you're so knowledgeable. It's so ple pleasant to, to you know, learn so much. Um, also, on my side, I enjoy so much teaching, although we are all completely remote, but I think we managed to actually have, you know, proper illumination, proper lights, proper bears moving during class. I don't know. I, I, I had fun. Although I do miss hearing uh, people like in, in person reacting and, and smiling. I don't see you smiling. I, I hope you are smiling and, you know, and you also have been uh, having uh, some, some fun with us. I mean, I, I definitely did. Uh, I hope you did too. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you everyone for, uh, you know, att attending this class and, and for your, for your attention. Uh, it's been, it's been a pleasure on my side as well. Uh, I, I hope um, I hope this was useful to you. If not, if, even if not everything was completely understandable, uh, I, you know we're we're kind of fine tuning. You know, Alfredo and I are kind of fine tuning this course over the years, and so it, you know it's getting better and better. You're not you're not getting the first the first version of this. You're yeah, I change everything halfway through this semester. I'm like I I already apologize, like because like given your energy based model thing and our perspective, then I I'm like oh. Now I see things from a different side and I, I cannot teach things like from the previous way. Right. So I'm like, OK, let's change everything. Why not? And but then I think actually it came out quite nicely. I think everything is consistent, consistent colors are consistent, notation and symbols are aligned. So, you know, um, things are getting better also on, you know, and, and it, this is good. I think it's an improvement. Okay. Right? So w one thing I should say is. Uh, you know, you might think that this the energy-based model way of presenting things is is you know is is sort of my own view, and it is okay. <laughs> there's, there's, there's a relatively small number of people who really kind of embrace that vision. I find it uh, simpler than and more understandable uh, at the sort of intuitive level than 
the sort of purely probabilistic uh, framework. There's a lot of models that you know can be explained through probabilities, but I th I don't think the you know looking at the equations gives you any intuition for what really is going on. So it might allow you to sort of you know kind of use those things blindly, but not really understand how they work. So I you know the EBM framework is really kind of the the simplest way I've, I've found that uh, relies on the the minimum amount of prior knowledge really to kind of uh, be able to um, to understand a large collection of different models, and and so it might be you know it might seem a little uh, annoying to you right now, but um, I think those, th I mean the the whole approach is kind of taken off. There's a whole workshop at iClear Friday actually on energy based models uh, in which I have a keynote. So um, so it's it's a it's a, it's an approach that I think is gaining gaining grounds. So you are maybe a little, a little bit in the same situation that students who took my machine learning and pattern recognition class in the early 2000s, the first few years I was at NYU, and I was teaching about multi-year neural nets. And a lot of students were wondering, why are you even talking about neural nets? Nobody is using neural nets ever. And I'm sure those people now are quite happy that they heard about neural nets from my class. Um, some of them actually are, you know, did a PhD with me and are now, you know, all kind of, you know, high, highly placed executives in various tech companies uh, and paid, you know, you know, seven figure salaries. So, um, <laughs> um, so you know, I I teach for for the long term. Uh, the the stuff you've learned has, I think, a relatively long shelf life, uh, hopefully. So enjoy. Also, Welcome. thanks uh, so much for uh, Vlad Subol and, and Josh and June. They, they've been creating the homework. They were, I think, amazing homework. Like, they're so high quality, right? Uh, the, the homework, the, the correction of the homework. The Josh took care of completely everything about this, uh, of this competition. And then, of course, we had the uh, graders, Tin and Niraj, that took care of, you know, going over all your submissions and making sure everything is actually on point. So thanks all you uh, behind the scene that you didn't appear in this, you know, on video. And again, that was pretty much, oh, we have Vlad here. Uh, we don't know whether Jachin is a camera is working, but uh, yes, it works working. Okay. So now we see everyone on, on screen. And with this uh, last uh, meeting here, we see you tomorrow for the uh, last class where we're going to be learning about uh, how to do prediction and planning with a stochastic environment with um, minimization of uncertainty. So all those nice things we saw so far all put together in the final lab of this course. Thank you again. See you tomorrow. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Take care.